point of the story of how the album plays out is you find yourself in here, you find yourself obsessed, but you know you need to leave.
Welcome to the Dreams of Conscious podcast. If you'd be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? My name is Drew Horton. I am the bass player in Sybaris. Andrew, how would you describe the music of Sybaris? Sybaris, from its inception, was always meant to be a death doom band. We pulled a lot of influence from black metal and drone and jazz as well, especially on the new album. But at its core, it's it's death doom. Just as getting as as deep and dark and as far into the cave as you can get. As as much reverb as we can get away with without it being too oppressive to just kind of make you feel like you're you're trapped in the cave with us. And as far as the the jazz elements that you that you mentioned, do you guys come from that background? Do any of you guys come from a a music school or a, a jazz improv back, background? Yeah, so mostly focused on our guitarist Alonzo and our drummer Aiden. They're the most apt guys. So Alonzo got a full ride scholarship to UCLA to study jazz bass. It's actually very frustrating because I play bass in the band and he's so much better than me at bass. <laughs> but it's just enabled him to be like an incredible musician. He's so good. And Aiden as well did a lot of jazz growing up. He's done other stuff as well. All of us come from other musical backgrounds. But when it comes to jazz, Alonzo and Aiden are the ones that really hold it down. A lot of really complex chords that like I, I do play guitar as well. So I can see when he pulls a chord out and I'm like, there's no way that's going to sound good. But when he's able to put it within the context of the song, it always blows my mind and Aiden really is quite quite good at being able to keep things up in really strange time signatures which I do, I do I did drums in another band as well and how people are able to play five four and then switch to seven eight and then four four and then start doing a waltz really quick just blows my mind and he's always been able to keep up with those things well tell me a little bit about your background drew what were you listening to or what do you listen to? So, so current, I mean, now I'm, I'm more metal focused. I, I try to keep a pretty, pretty broad and open mind. I grew up in Southern California. I played in like a little high school band that never played live, but we would play in the living room or in the garage, just like indie, indie rock stuff. I got in really into emo music, but like good emo, I'm not talking MCR. I'm talking right to spring, I'm talking snowing, like kind of Midwest stuff for a long time. And then I started really getting into metal in my mid twenties, joined a black metal, like a black and death band. And then when that band fell apart, that's when I got approached by someone who knew Sybaris was looking for a bass player. And when I got into that, it's really good. I found having been in a couple other bands to have people that are more open and willing to listen to other styles of music. The first band I was in was really was like the black the black and death band was mostly by guys that only listen to metal. And I think that's a little constraining because you're not able to pull influence from anything else. Like you should you should be able to be mature and man enough to listen to pop. It's, it's not it's not a big deal. You should be able to listen to techno music and to to hip hop and stuff. And those things really you may not realize it, but they do influence you and they do influence the music that you make and how open-minded you can be to create new things. The older I get, the more I realize that scales are scales, tempos are tempos, and a lot of what people consider to be genre is actually just production. Yeah, completely. You can honestly make a pop music, like a, a pop song sound like metal, depending on how gritty you're able to make it. And conversely, there's a lot of metal bands that when you look at it, they're really not making what we call quote unquote metal. It's, it's just kind of in the genre because they dress scary and they have spooky lyrics. Right. Going back to, to the beginnings of Sifaris, did you know Alonzo and Aiden and, and the rest of the guys before you joined? So I had been aware, hold on. So I actually currently live with, Lord Fowl, Isaiah, the vocalist. Okay. And I hear him being loud on the phone. So I'm going to tell him to be a little quieter. <laughs> anyway, 
So I, or at least I got, I got into, or at least do some guttural, uh, so we, we, we have some, some, uh, some depth vocals in the background. Yeah. No, I hear him. I hear him like he's on the phone. (laughs) (laughs) So I, I was in a band called Blood Sanctum. That band unfortunately fell apart. And I, I was very like tangentially in the scene out here. That band was in Orange County and we're, we're based in Long Beach, Los Angeles. So I, I had known of Sybaris. I had seen I had seen them live at the time. They opened for Mortiferum. When that band fell apart, the drummer that was in in Blood Sanctum at the time messaged me and he said, Hey, do you know who Sybaris is? And I was like, Oh yeah, Sybaris, the chain band, because Isaiah at the time would play live with a big metal chain and he'd smack it on the ground and wave it and almost hit you with it. <laughs> so it left an impression. And I was like, Oh yeah, totally. I, I know who that is. And he's like, well, they're looking for a bass player. And I was like, all right, let me know. And we we hooked up and I, I got in. We had a different drummer at the time. And then when he left, he was replaced. And then when that person left, we actually found Aiden because Aiden moved here from Chicago after school a few years ago. And he liked Sivirus enough that he was doing like drum videos. And he sent us a video of him playing one of the songs and we were like done easy and asked him to to come in and he joined in and he meshed so well that it was that was an easy fit immediately as for the other guys isaiah and our other guitarist daniel have known each other since they were children they grew up together and isaiah was he was in a dance troupe his mom owns a dance studio and she teaches like classic like folklorico mexican dance and alonzo was one of the students and he's significantly younger than the rest of us we're all me daniel and isaiah are 31 or 32 aiden's 28 and alonzo is turning 24 so he was always younger but he came in and isaiah was like do you want to because he knew he played guitar. He said, do you want to start a band? And he was he was down because Daniel had talked to Isaiah about it. He wanted to do a Death Doom band. And Alonzo was like, sure. And he was 17 at the time and he joined in. And that was the first iteration was those three. They got another friend to play bass and another person to play drums. And then just things moved around a little bit until we settled on this being like the definitive lineup. So did the lineup come together, the current lineup come together before the demos were recorded? No, so the de- I was not on the demos. I didn't come on until Decrepit Flesh Relic. Okay. At the time of the demos, it was those three, Daniel, Isaiah, and Alonzo, uh, a different bass player. His name is Jay. He he was great. Love him. But he is a, a deathcore guy, <laughs> and he wanted to pursue that. And so, you know, you can't force someone to be in a band if they don't want to, so... That's how they parted ways with him. And then I, I jumped in on that. The first drummer just couldn't do it anymore. So he was out. The second drummer was the the drummer that was in the band when I joined. He didn't want to do it anymore. So he, he quit as well. Then we had one more drummer, Matt, who was great, but just not really his style of music. So he left. And then that's when Aiden came in and just fit. Okay. With all your your varied backgrounds and the jazz influence and the other things that you mentioned, why Death Doom? Why was that the sound that you guys gravitated towards? Honestly, everyone in this band is just a dick writer for Spectral Voice. <laughs> we were all so obsessed. It was so great that they put out a new album recently. But like the necrotic demos and eroded corridors, like just constant repeats for everybody. So just like getting that that as like the core of like, we want to do this has been very central. So like, even like when the new one came out, I keep forgetting how to pronounce it, like Spargamas or whatever. When that came out, we're like listening to it and just like thinking like, oh, we have to do this. Like what they're doing right here with these leads, like these clean leads is so good. Like we're going to honestly is really obsessed with that sound and but at the same time, wanting to be able to kind of evolve it a little bit and branch out just slightly to make it more interesting. We also all love Disembedded Cotton's 
just the genre itself is just so good. And I feel like there's there was a really big explosion of OSDM a few years ago. And that just isn't the kind of thing that we want to do. Just having it just be like really bare bones chugging and and trem riffs. We want to we want to be able to have these long pauses of the doom moments to really like settle you into the the dread feeling. Yeah. How do you guys usually write songs? How does the song start for you guys? So we'll approach with a riff. Alonzo or Daniel usually will have something like that they've been working on, and we'll we'll meet up. We we do practice every Saturday. We have a we have a really nice space, thankfully, from Isaiah's cousin. He has a black and gold studio in Whittier, California. So we meet up every Saturday when we start writing new stuff. One of them will say, here's what I've been working on. And it's kind of like a classroom style where they present the riff and we'll kind of tweak it if it needs to get tweaked. Just say like, okay, like I think you should hold this note longer or you should hit this. Daniel and Alonzo are really good at just playing off of each other because Alonzo's very technical and he can play really well. But Daniel has this kind of like soulful, mournful ability that he's able to pull out of his guitar. And you'll notice that on um, you can kind of feel it, which songs are more Daniel and more Alonzo. So it's not out yet, but Gary on the final track on the, the album is like almost entirely Daniel's song. And you can really feel it just in the style of it. It's it's a lot slower. Like, yeah, there's still, you know, blast beats and stuff, but the the overall pace of the song feels a lot slower. You know, there's no solos or anything. And at the same time, it just it like kind of makes you feel sad, but hopeful near the end. Whereas when you look at like Shrouded and Crystals, Alonzo came in. That was the first song we wrote. Alonzo came in with just this really nasty looking chord that he shifts and he's just like, this is how it's going to start. Dun, dun. And we're like, OK, OK, great. And then they just kind of go back and forth with each other and they piece together the rest of it. We think, OK, does this need to slow down or stop? What can we do here? And my contributions will just be like helping fine tune things, just saying like, I think you need to do this longer. I think we should break here. I think one guitar should cut out here, just things like that. And we just kind of bring it together. Isaiah does the vocals and we, we give him a little bit of input on the vocals, but they're mostly his own but he will mostly step in to say, you need to do this blast beat. You need to do this kind of blast beat. He loves to say, you need to do a Euro, which is just like a one, two. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's just like a very collaborative effort. And nobody ever fights like, oh, I don't like this song. This sucks. Like you need to do this <laughs> instead. It's always just like, I can make this better. And then they show you how. That's awesome.
I'd like to speak about the bass a little bit because the bass is it, it has a kind of a an ambiguous role in in death metal. You know, with between the the double bass drumming and, and the downtuned guitars, the bass often gets lost. What would you say the role of the bass is in Sivers, and what's your approach to playing bass? So we play in G sharp. Both the guys play seven string guitars, and I play a six string bass. I used to play a five string, but I had a six string that was busted and I got it fixed up and it just looks so nice and it feels good. So I have to play it now. And we're hoping we're going to expand the bass a little bit more for the, for the third, the third album, just so I can utilize one more string now that I have it. But when it comes for me to bass is we're already so low, I can go lower than they can and just fill out the sound even more, especially live. You know, you listen to the music in your car or on your AirPods or whatever off your phone, and you can always hear the bass, but it's a little subdued. But I feel like live is where I get to shine because I I make sure that it's nice and loud and just really rumbles for everybody. I I don't go too crazy a lot of bands right now that while I'm not saying it's bad, they're very focused on like very technical bass playing. A lot of people are using fretless basses recently, which is cool and I love the way it sounds, but I don't think it would fit with us. I just want to make sure that whatever note that they're hitting, I'm hitting the same note and making sure that they're getting as much like punch to it as possible. I do play fingers. I don't play with a pick. I find it's better for control and I like I like the more rounded sound to it, whereas with a pick, you're going to get that pick scrape and that kind of like metallic like chick noise to it. We do record with me playing with a pick just so that it, it get, can get dialed in on the production a little bit better. But when we practice and when we play live, I do fingers just so that it's it's just as like a rounded sound as possible. So for you, the, the bass in, in Sivirus adds to the, the cavernous sound, that oppressive sound. Yeah, I try, I try to make it to, to just make it full, as full as I can. We we use a lot of pedals until recently. The the guys have gone from pedals to using like a quad cortex, just like a, it's like a big computer pedal board for your guitar. Essentially, I'm still a little slightly more old school in that I like a pedal board. I like being able to just like take something out and put something new in. And so it it's really helped me like kind of find the exact layout that I want to give me the sound. So my board runs through it's a tuner a compressor and then i have a dark glass the alpha omega overdrive so that's that's my general normal tone is just a compressor on and then the dark glass the overdrive it makes it really thick and crunchy but when we get into doom sections i have a earthquaker the sun pedal the life pedal it's incredible it's a fuzz and an octave at the same time so when you turn it on you're hearing your regular tone with the overdrive. You're getting fuzz on top of it, and then you're getting an octave lower of whatever you're playing. So it just makes this big, huge, great rumble, and you can feel it in your feet. And then on top of that, a reverb to make it just as expansive as, po as possible. That's awesome. So let's talk about Maze Envy. This will be your second full length, and it will be released by 20 Bucks Spin on the 22nd of March. When did you guys start working on the album? We started working on it like almost as soon as the first album, Decrepit Flesh Relic on Transylvanian was was finished. We had finished that album and we went and we did a small a small West Coast tour out here in California. But when we got back, Alonzo had already started with Shrouded and he he had the opening chords to it. And so we're still playing shows, doing all the DFR stuff went to Mexico City and everything, but he was just like, this is what I'm working on. This is going to be the second one. And we were all really excited. And then once we started writing it more and more, when we realized, okay, this is going to be different than the first one. And it's going to be like, not that it's longer because they're both about the same length, but it's going to be bigger. That's when we, we reached out to Dave at 20 buck who's been incredible. He's such a great guy. But we reached out and we said, would you be interested in this? And he said, yes. We hadn't recorded it yet. It was it was all just like demos off of our phones and stuff. 
And when he said he was interested, we were like, great, like, tell us what you need from us. And he, he really like set us up for a lot. It's been great. Like, like we all love that label and the bands on that label are, are awesome. So it's, it's just been really cool. Like putting that together, meeting the other bands. We toured, we did a small tour with Atrabilis and Anigmatum where we all went to Canada for a couple dates and then back down the West coast. And everybody has the same story to tell of how great Dave is and we're like feeding off of each other especially atrabilis had like a big a big impact on us because we saw like their technicality really inspired alonzo and daniel to just work on work on their playing and the the equipment that they used was definitely a really really well they i don't even know how to explain it but they've got this big box that they run all their stuff all the guitars and the drums and the vocals and everything go into this thing and they have a laptop that tracks them to in your monitors so that they know changes and progressions and stuff it's insane but we see that and we're like okay we need to start stepping our game up and that's when the boys started getting the the new boards for their guitars to just kind of progress us to the next level it does feel like a much more ambitious album than uh decrepit flesh relic it, it feels like a lot of the the other elements and the other influences that you have outside of metal are really pushing your sound in different directions. Yeah, when we did DFR, I do I do really like that album and I like everything on it, but it was definitely very just like this is the sound we have and that we're going to give it to you. Whereas when we started doing Maze Envy, we wanted to start pulling more and more. So like Aiden has a drum solo on Maze Envy. And that's not something we would have done on DFR. We we were really excited. Like when we like kind of pieced together this idea of like, Hey, what if we had a break and Aiden just starts going crazy? I was like, Oh, okay. And then we try it and he just busts out this really cool solo. Or like, yes, like we need to do this. We like, we keep going forward. We, we have a, The original version of Labyrinth Charm was seven minutes long because there was a two and a half minute instrumental, like clean guitar in front of it. And then we realized like, okay, that might be a bit much. And so we separated that into a different track, which sounds gorgeous and beautiful, but just little things that we, we just kind of piece together. Like this is a better idea than this. Like it sounds really cool and it definitely, they should be played together, but like realistically, not everyone's gonna want to to hear it like that so we we did chunk that one out so originally endless symmetry and labyrinth charm were the same song yes okay cool um they were both together endless symmetry is just guitar and bass we do drums live but on the track it's just guitar and bass but it it's 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 kind of like a spiraling feeling it's what it's what endless symmetry is supposed to be it's you getting inside the maze and you're completely lost and that's like the kind of the descending arpeggios of it is what it's supposed to feel like but it's it's very long for an intro and so we realize like okay that that might be a bit much but we're not getting rid of it because it's too good but maybe maybe it shouldn't be part of labyrinth charm just because that's going to make it a little too long is this a concept album yeah maze envy is absolutely a concept album we think these things through ahead of time so Isaiah came with the album title already, and he has the next one planned out as well. We were talking about it in the car yesterday. But for Maze Envy, he had a really rough patch in his life for a little bit a couple years ago, and it led him to this feeling of being trapped in, in a maze in a labyrinth and being envious of the people who were able to reach the center and then find their way back out. And so we just kind of tried to explore that concept of being lost in like the labyrinth of your own mind, of your own depression and thinking like, I'm stuck here forever. There's no way I'm getting out. I'm trapped. I'm obsessed with finding like whatever is in the center of this maze, but it ultimately I need to get out. And that's kind of the story of how the album plays out is you find yourself in here, you find yourself obsessed but you know you need to leave. Where did you guys end up recording the album? We recorded with the same person we did DFR with, which is Andrew J of Dead Stare Audio. 
that's another good friend of ours that they've known Isaiah and Alonzo and Daniel have known for like years and years, like high school. So when we were ready with this, we we're ready to start recording. We, we just went right back. We told Dave, you know, we want to go with Andrew again. And he said, okay, no problem. He always has recommendations of like, if you want to do this, you know, I can, I can hook you up with this person or, you know, you can fly up to another city and record there however you want to do it. And we're like, we're going to go with Andrew again. Maybe in the future, we'll look elsewhere. But right now, like we, we still want to use him. And he said, no problem. You know, it's your, your guys' music. You, you shape it how you want. And so we said, okay, great. And we recorded with him. We had a few different spots. We record a little bit on our own. So the, some of the string segments are not synthesizers. They're live, like violins and, and bass and everything. We've recorded ourselves a lot, like Alonzo at school. We've recorded, we've recorded like on DFR, the title track, Rot Delineated, Carpet Flesh Relic. We recorded that in the garage here almost entirely. It was just us. But aside from that, we recorded in North Hollywood. I can't remember the name of the studio is where we did the drums, but apparently it's the studio where Papa Roach records. (laughs) So that was interesting. A lot lot of records on the wall. A lot of us singing Last Resort and Scars. (laughs) Um, And then Andrew Deadstare has has his own studio. Where's where's that bonus track? Yeah, I know, right? You got to just see the videos on my Instagram of me at karaoke if you want to see Last Resort from (laughs) Sybaris. Nice.
so Andrew's also in the band Apparition, who I believe will be the episode just before this one. Uh, are, are, oh, great. Are, are, are the two bands pretty friendly, Service and Apparition? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, we all know each other. Dude, it seems like the you guys are on, on a similar wavelength in terms of Miles and, and the drummer and Apparition uh, also come from a, a jazz background. Yeah, so it, it's really interesting, too, also because Alonzo has played in Apparition as well. He he plays live. So Apparition is really interesting because it has Taylor Young and he has a lot of other like band obligations and stuff like having like doing God's Hate and everything like that. So every now and then and same with Andrew, like his recording schedule will get busy. So every now and then either Taylor or Andrew can't can't play a live show that they booked or that they really want to play. And they just ask Alonzo. And so Alonzo will play guitar or bass for Apparition. And he just jumps in, which is really cool. So that's that's actually really made us all mesh really well together as well. And we all hang out. Like Miles was at the Sivers practice last week, like just came through, wanted to hang. We all just chilled. And it, it's really helped both the bands mesh well. It's interesting, the kind of the dichotomy between the two. Like we're on 20 Buck and they're on Profound but we all know each other and we play shows and we're all friends and it's, it's just, it's great with that band. Is, is dead stare Andrew's studio? Yeah. Okay. Besides the, the closeness that you, you feel with the band and, and the comfort, what do you like about working with Andrew and what would you say he brings to your sound? Andrew's a reader. He, he gives great notes. So I, I mean, anybody in a band will tell you that you'll, you'll come in and you're like, this is the song that we're going to play and we're going to play it like this. And you're going to press the button and hit record and just mix it after. But we'll be playing and he will, we'll get through a take and he will give us a suggestion. Like you should do this. Like you should hit like not, not necessarily musical. Like you need to play this note, but he will give a suggestion. Like you should ring this slightly longer or you should, instead of hitting hitting it on this beat you should hit it on this beat he was really really good when it came to the vocals too just like helping helping isaiah push through like you know maybe you maybe this part shouldn't be a low maybe you should do highs on this part and giving that suggestion and saying and what he loves to do is just try it just try it just try it and isaiah's like no i'm not trying it and he's like just try it once <laughs> and then he hits record and you can't really say no and it starts playing you have to try it and some of those things are like end end up on. Oh. Sorry, it sounds like trying to get a kid to eat his vegetables. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Which he doesn't do. I'll tell you that as a roommate. <laughs> but just like, like the section on shrouded and crystals when it's that kind of growling retrieval of the primal soul. A lot of that was Andrew's contribution of like, this doesn't need to just be super guttural, like we because we talk about cattle decapitation and travis ryan's recent like kind of clean vocals is what we call goblin voice <laughs> and he's like just try the goblin voice try it like that try try whispering it and just little little things and then he he layered them so well that it just sounds so like disgusting and awesome that we're like okay maybe you're right about some things nice do you want to say anything about nick townsend the guy who, who mastered the album I still don't honestly understand what guys do when they master an album because you're the guy to master it. Yeah, I don't either. And you pay them and you're just like, man, this is crazy. There's no way this is this is worth the money. And then they send it back and you're like, all right, shit, that was really fucking good. That sounds so good now. It's not like they make it louder. They make it just sound right. So like it sounds amazing when Andrew mixes it and we're all excited and it's on our phones and we play it in the car all the time and stuff. And then you send it to someone, you send it to Nick and he masters it and he sends it back. And it's just like, this sounded good. And now it sounds good and great. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. It just, it just sounds correct. Like it, this is the way it's meant to be heard. And so whatever those guys do, keep doing it. You're doing a great job, but I still don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really understand mastering either. I think the best explanation I've gotten is that mastering is specific to the different formats. And so you'll have a, a vinyl master, you'll have a digital master, mm -hmm. things like that. And, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll speak to a band and they'll say, you know, the guy who mastered it, they, 
the instructions to him were to make it sound like the mix. And I'm like, but the mix already sounds like the mix. <laughs> yeah. Why do you need yeah. the mix to sound more like the mix? You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm pretty clueless as to what uh, mastering is. But it seems like Nick Townsend is, is pretty well regarded. Seems like a lot of people like his work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we were more than happy with what he did. So do you guys have any plans to do any tours or play any festivals over the summer? So we currently have just a few shows set up. We're going to be playing tomorrow, actually, with Skeletal Remains, opening up for them at the Terror the Album Release show, which is going to be in Seattle. We're playing Disembowed God Fest on the 30th of March. So like a week after the album comes out, we'll be playing in Seattle, which is really exciting. We played Seattle twice now, and it's a great show every time. I love that city. It's just awesome every time we're there. We have Austin Death Fest, which is a new festival with an incredibly stacked lineup of, you know, Two Mold, Mortiferum, Outer Heaven, Phobophilic, Witch Vomit. Just there's so many bands on that. that are just so good. So really excited about that. We do have Death Over Bakersfield in June, which is a, a thing that happens in Bakersfield, which for any people outside of California, Bakersfield is a weird place in the kind of the lower middle of the state just it's just odd as the and Demency and a lot of other bands from LA are coming up there to do it which is going to be great we have a Wayfarer opening for Wayfarer in May as well we're currently trying to work something out to do a few more dates with Hell we we know MSW pretty well and he did feature on one of the demos so we're really excited to do that we don't have anything concrete done for the rest of the year except we will be going back to europe for like a nine to ten show run the very end of november into december we don't we we have a couple of things booked but we're not allowed to talk about it but we will be in oslo for sure we don't have anything else that we are allowed to say but those are the the upcoming stuff for severus very cool so by the time people hear this, Maze Envy will be out through 20 Books Spin. Drew, please tell people how they can order the album. What's the best way to get it? The best way to order the album is going to be through the 20 Bucks Spin label page on Bandcamp. There's three color variants of the LP. If you're interested in wax, they are gorgeous. Dave really hooked it up with what the vinyl looks like. It's exactly what we wanted. You can also order direct from the 20 Bucks Spin store on 20buckspin.com it'll be on all the streaming services spotify apple music it won't be on our band camp it'll be on the 20 bucks spin band camp so make sure that you are on 20 bucks spin and there will be a youtube link as well and all all of the merch for Sybaris will either be through 20 bucks spin or any small pressings that we do in our kitchen will be on our page or live on your own band camp page yeah on our own on the Sybaris band camp page okay cool and if people want to follow Sivirus online, what's the best way to do that? You can follow us on Instagram at Sivirus underscore disease. We don't have Twitter except for me. If you're interested in my Twitter, which is not that exciting, but I think it is. It's Tiraviesh, T-I-R-R-I-V-E-E-I-S-H. Very difficult, but look it up and you'll find it. Aside from that, if you if you do follow the Sivers Instagram page, you'll see all of our personal profiles as well. We don't use Facebook or anything else like that. Is there anything else you want to say? Thank you for the interview. This was really nice. Really excited for the album to come out. Really cool. The One of the great things about making music and making this kind of music is meeting people from around the world. I feel extraordinarily humbled every time I know that someone... 3,000, 5,000 miles away is aware that I exist. The same goes for the rest of the band. So that's just for everybody. Thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Drew.